So um, welcome everyone to the December meeting of the Nottingham Zone of Adjustment, the Nottingham Zoning Board of Adjustment, excuse me. We have two hearings this evening on the agenda. The first one is a case that is continued from our last month's meeting. And the second one is a new application. So assuming that representatives from both of those cases are also here, Joanna? Yes? So I'd like to first introduce members of the board who are present here this evening. I'm Bonnie Winona McKinnon. I'm the chairman of the board. Um, Joanna, who will mute and unmute people perhaps is our land use clerk and attends all our meetings and uh, writes the minutes and takes notes and keeps us all in order. Um, Terry Bonzer, who suddenly jumped into the front screen. Yeah, I'm Terry, Terry Bonzer. Terry Bonzer, um, is Teresa Bascom here? Yes, I'm here. Thank you, Teresa. Raylene Shippy Rice, are you here? I can't hear you. Yes, I am here. Okay, great. And um, Kevin Bassett? I can't hear you either. Yes, I'm here. Okay, thank you, Kevin. So um, we will we will begin with the public hearings. Um, we will begin with the case that we took up last month first. Um, the applicant will have the opportunity to present his case. We, we um, heard a whole presentation last month um, and we went on a site walk with the applicant and his um, people to look at the wetlands crossing that he needs a variance for the crossings. There were two of them, if I remember correctly. Um, the applicant will have a chance to speak. Um, any members of the board may ask questions during the, may ask questions politely during the applicant's presentation um, and after the presentation. And then I will open it up to um, any abutters or members of the public who wish to speak to the application either for or against. And then the, the last <clears throat> person to speak will be the applicant. He will have the right to uh, address any concerns that were raised by the public. So that being said, I would like to um, turn it over to Mr. Robert DeBerto's agent. I don't think Mr. DeBerto is here himself. Um, I don't have it on my public hearing list, but who's, Chris, are you representing him? Yes, yeah. ma'am, I'm, I'm present. Okay. So um, would you take, take it from here? You took us on the site walk, uh, I think it was back in November. So um, last month we met, uh, we had a, a very in-depth uh, discussion and conversation about Mr. DeBerto's project on Mitchell Road. And just to refresh the board's memory, we're here to discuss a variance uh, application for the uh, impact directly within the wetlands. Uh, we're not here to discuss the application in totality or the project in totality. Um, it's been determined that uh, through your zoning ordinance that a variance is required for any disturbance, dredging and or filling inside of a, a jurisdictional wetland. And if, so, I, if I interrupt you for a second here, Chris, um, let me just underline what he said. And I, generally I read the, the case history, which I neglected to do in this case. So if, if I can just insert um, what this hearing is about, it is case number 20014-VA Application from Robert DeBerto requesting a variance from Article 3, Section B4 of the Nottingham Zoning Ordinance to permit filling 6,717 square feet of a PF01 slash 4EG wetland as part of the road construction for a proposed subdivision. The property is located on Mitchell Road in Nottingham and is identified as tax map 7 lot 1 sublot N. And yes, that is the matter before the board. So thank you for pointing that out. You have the floor again, Chris. So uh, we discussed <clears throat> at the last meeting, there are two impact areas that make up the total uh, square footage of approximately 6,700 square feet. There's impact area one, 
which is at the center of the par parcel uh, and project. And then there's impact area two, uh, which affects Lipizan Drive, uh, which goes out to three additional lots. Um, each one of these wetland crossings is uh, and has been designed uh, to meet the best management practices of uh, New Hampshire Department of Environmental Services, as well as the Army Corps of Engineers. And we went over all of the minimization and avoidance um, criteria that we worked through to choose these locations. Um, after a lot of discussion about uh, how stormwater would work, how the crossings work themselves, the purpose of the crossings, uh, the demonstration of the need of the crossings, uh, the board decided that they would like some additional time to review the materials submitted to them and to conduct a site walk. Um, since that time, we've met with the board and conducted a site walk and both myself and my uh, project engineer uh, walked out uh, the site. Uh, we first looked at impact area number two. Uh, there were some observations made by the board uh, a couple of questions asked concerning um, the how how seasonally uh, this uh, area is wet, and then we discussed the vegetation uh, that's in that area and the limits at which the uh, impact would take place. They were flagged in the field. Both the center line uh, of the roadway was flagged, and the limits of the impact area were also flagged for the board's review. And then we walked uh, upslope slightly and we looked at uh, the same uh, attributes in impact area number one and reviewed the, um, the wetlands upslope and reviewed the wetlands downslope. And again, the center line of that area was flagged out. The center line of the entire road had been flagged out and the uh, limits of the impact area were also flagged. And uh, we then discussed the nature of each one of the crossings um, and how they were um, being designed to manage both stormwater, but also um, secondary impacts to uh, animals, amphibians, and things of the like that traverse through the wetlands and through the buffers. Uh, we discussed uh, slope and we discussed how we were managing specifically in this crossing how we were managing the stormwater so that stormwater did not sheet off the roadway directly into the wetlands, but it was being captured first by uh, detention cells and treated through the, uh, the stormwater systems. So uh, with that, Madam Chair, I'd be happy to try and answer any additional uh, questions that the board uh, might have, uh, but we have no new uh, information for the board. Right. So, um... Does anyone have questions of Mr. Gray this evening? Or comments? So um, I, I will say that there were a lot of questions asked of the by board members, Kevin Bassett especially at that site walk. And um, it was educational, I think, for the board in many ways to see the lay of the land, to see that where the, the actual crossings are, are kind of on the edge of things. Um, it's not, it's, it's, um, it was asked why, why they didn't have two roads and thus were able to avoid these crossings. And um, apparently the planning board and, and the conservation commission both felt that this particular plan as submitted um, had the least impact because it, it had less impervious surface, I believe. Does anyone else wish to add anything? Okay, there being yeah, no- Madam, Madam Chair, Kevin here. Okay, Kevin. Um, just, just to add to that, uh, specific to crossing number two, um, to the left, as far as the picture that was just shown, um, it, it, it has no source. In other words, it doesn't have an upstream, um, an uphill um, source other than just upland um, runoff. There's no observable uh, water flow on the surface. In other words, there's no belly where um, leaves and things have been perturbed by water flow. Water in this area from at least my non-geological experiences is underground and um, 
and the impact is going to be minimal. There may be standing water once there, there is a culvert there and, and such, um, but the actual water flow has not been on the surface for obviously decades. There's a lot of moss and there's a lot of vegetation between the um, observable rocks. The observable rocks, um, you only see the top of, which means there's soil around them and it hasn't been disturbed by moving water. Um, crossing number one is a slightly different. It does have a source uphill. Um, blueberry bogs is my definition of those sources. Um, but there again, there is absolutely no surface water um, observation that, that I could make. Um, the water that goes between those bogs um, is underground and has been underground for for quite some time. Um, the area between where the crossing is laid out is a, is a flat spot. Um, it might have been a, a skitter trail or what have you in the past, but uh, there are no skitter marks in that uh, area, which was a little surprising. So that says the soil is probably hard or rocky or what have you underneath. So um, um, again, there was no um, observable water flow on the surface that disturbs leaves and soils and, uh, you know, prohibits Ross, uh, um, 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 the, the rocks being exposed from moss and, and et cetera. Um, so with that, I am going to be in favor of this, um, um, uh, uh, development as, as we go forward. Thank you, Kevin. Do, do any other board members have questions or comments? Okay, there being none from the board, do any members of the public wish to speak at this point in time? Okay, there appears to be no, no further questions of the applicant. So at this Not point, true. I, I, I hit the raise hand button there, All right. Madam Chair, Chairwoman, so. I see that you did, Steve. I apologize. I'm uh, Joanna. Um, I don't know if you have to unmute people, but clearly he's unmuted. Well, you have the floor, sir. Um, sure. I have some questions uh, for uh, the committee and, um, and then for the applicant. Um, is for the committee, is there a written record of this site uh, walk that can be reviewed? What kind of minutes or record is created uh, that the public can review over this site walk? Um, there are minutes which are probably not approved yet. Joanna, are they available for, for someone to receive either by email or other means? Yes, I can send them by email, but yeah, you're correct. They are not approved yet. So at this point, there are no minutes. Uh, there are minutes, they're just not approved and that's normal. You don't approve them till after um, the case is closed usually. We, uh, unless she has them up for this evening, we probably will approve the minutes for the whole case at one time. And is, the public allowed, is, the, is the public allowed to see the minutes uh, before yeah. approval or after approval? Both, both. Joanna said she would be happy to email them to you if you wish oh. to. Okay, that would be great if you could furnish anyone, uh, myself, any of the other butters that might be interested, it would be great to see those. So uh, so I don't know what, Joanna, what do you require? Do you need his email address or how? You're not, you're probably not going to have time to review them before we vote on it, but unless she can send them to you now and I don't really know how she's set up. I can send them to him now, but, um, or I can share them on the screen, it's up to the board. Well, I'd, I'd like the opportunity to review them. Um, uh, it's your choice if you're going to proceed with a vote at this point. Um, in, uh, Madam Chairwoman, at the previous session, you said this was the first venture of the Zoning Board of Appeal into questions uh, like this around wetlands. Is that correct? It's the first venture in my memory. How's that? Okay, that's good. Thank you for the whole um, the board, but so my, my next it. question is uh, Have you retained an expert to review this application and some of the objections that have been raised uh, by the abutters here? Or are you solely relying on the representation of the applicant? 
we're relying on the representation of the applicant and testimony from the public. And we have not retained an expert, no. Um, does the, did, did the, um, what you call a walk, which I've not seen the documentation for, and uh, frankly would object to you guys deciding until you do uh, distribute to the public uh, the documentation of what you did during the walk. Does the walk uh, describe in any way uh, or make an assessment of the vernal, of the possibility of vernal pools there? No, because that question is not before the board. That is a planning board question, a planning board issue. It's nothing that is there that he's requesting a variance for. Um, Madam Chair, purview. Madam, what, Madam, Madam Chair, Teresa, um, I I also would like to state that the public was invited to this site walk, so um, I don't know why you didn't join us, sir. But you were invited. It wasn't done in secret. Um, you could have asked a whole lot of questions there instead of rehashing this whole case. We're all prepared to vote. Well, I'm, I'm sorry if you're offended by a request for due process here, but um, I am unaware of the invitation. Um, if it was sent, um, uh, I see that other butters don't say that they were um, invited either. And, and I would like the record to reflect that we were not invited to this walk. I certainly didn't get notice of it. Um, it's public notice. I can, speak to that. I, can I can speak to that, Steve. Um, you, you do not receive a written notice. You do, we post it. We are required to post all gatherings of this board um, on the town website and in other places like in the town hall. And I don't know where else Joanna might post them, perhaps the post office. Um, so right. they are publicly posted according to the requirements of the law. And it was mentioned at the end of the meeting that we would be doing a site walk so that people should have been aware to look for it. It was, no, it was noticed at that meeting on the, on the 17th of November that we would be doing a site walk. Yes, but there was, I'm sorry, I was unaware of any time or date that was mentioned during the hearing of when this would take place. But uh, the chairwoman says that proper notice was given of it. I, uh, well, if that's the way it works, that's the way it works. Um, I, I will say that um, I made sure of that with Joanna and that she had done it and she had. So. Okay. Um, but because I, did, I, did, I did discuss the procedure okay. with an attorney so to make sure we did it properly. Okay. So uh, as an abutter and as a resident of the town, let me object to the chairwoman's uh, interpretation that vernal pools are not in your jurisdiction. Wetlands are in your jurisdiction. Vernal pools are part of the wetlands. Under um, the, uh, the Waters of the United States statute that the Army of, uh, U.S. Army of, uh, Corps of Engineers operates in terms of dealing with, I'm sorry, I realize that the picture isn't here. I, uh, you might as well, uh, I might as well try to be visible here. Let me see if I can do that. Um, here we go. Um, so under the uh, Waters of the United States, uh, the, the U.S. code that sets out how the uh, Department of uh, uh, the Army Corps of Engineers operates, uh, vernal pools are very much considered uh, part of wetlands. And uh, the question is a matter of jurisdiction, whether it's a federal decision or a state decision uh, as to what might be considered uh, a vernal wetland to deal with. So I, uh, I believe the chairwoman has made a misinterpretation of the law here, and I, I object to the proceedings uh, that uh, in the incorrect statement that, uh, that vernal pools are irrelevant here. Um, the applicant uh, filed documents last time in which there was a, an expert who had asserted that he had not identified any vernal pools. So, uh, and that's an assessment that I, uh, took issue with because the timing of it, the vernal pool does not appear um, ordinarily at the time that that uh, uh, the, the expert claimed uh, that he had not seen uh, such a thing. Um, and the fact is, is that a walk now in November, because vernal pools, um, they are springtime, uh, would not be um, visible at this point. Uh, That's not entirely it. true. I think I can address that, Teresa. I, I, let me first have a crack at it. So, Mr. Kerwood, 
um, we are not here to examine this entire project. That is the province of the planning board. We are here to look at those two crossing areas for which he's seeking a variance. And there are no, there were no vernal pools identified in those two particular areas. I'm not saying, I'm not saying that there are not po the possibility of vernal pools on the whole piece of land, but that's not our purview. That is the planning board's purview. And they are the ones I, who reviewed the, the data for his entire plan. We are looking at a request for a variance at two spots on this land. And really, so, yeah, so your, your, your jurisdiction here regards uh, our town ordinance, it's article three and section B4, um, when it comes to dealing uh, with such questions as wetlands. And the last time I looked, uh, a vernal pool is part of wetlands. And this in fact was kicked to you guys so that you would consider the matter of wetlands. So um, also um, there was um, the, the, the applicant, uh, uh, mentioned in a cursory way that, oh, in a secondary level, uh, there may be, you know, what animals, oh, they're not going to be affected. The primary question was around storm runoff. I agree, storm runoff is a big deal. But also, we have endangered species. We have threatened species in this area, which is why I've been very concerned about all of this. Um, and the, uh, and it, so um, I, I think it's incumbent on the board to adequately document um, that this has been done. What I'm hearing is, is that this is the first time in recent memory that the board has addressed such a question regarding wetlands. It's brought to you by the planning board because they were concerned that you would have to abrogate the requirements under Article 3, Section B4. Um, I'm concerned that you haven't sought expert uh, advice on this. And I have, uh, for example, and that there's disregard of the question of any uh, endangered or threatened uh, species that are there. We know that uh, particularly the painted turtle is in this area. Um, and for the, I, I have a question, a couple of questions for the applicant, if I may, um, uh, or no, I need to direct them to you. I'm sorry, Madam Chairwoman, and then you can ask him. Um, so one question is, uh, by the way, where are the spoils going from the dredging that's gonna have to happen for this? That's a question for Mr. Barry. It is being reused being, on site. Uh, it, it, they're being used on uh, site. He's on already site. answered that question, Bonnie, when we were out there. Well, we. I'm sorry, I wasn't there. I didn't get the invitation. Sorry. I wasn't talking to you. I was talking to Bonnie. <laughs> okay. Mr. Barry, could you answer that question for him, please? So Madam Chair, the materials that are dredged out of the wetlands would be placed outside of the wetlands for dewatering. And then generally they would be mixed back into topsoil and used on site. Um, Madam Chairman, has the application for this um, dredging and, and, and uh, um, certain filling and, uh, and um, this construction in this wetland area. Has there been any application submitted to the Department of Environmental Services of the state of New Hampshire? Mr. Berry, I, I believe there has been. Could you yes, speak we to that? submitted the um, NHDES wetlands uh, application to the Wetlands Bureau. They have a request for more information, which we've answered. Uh, there's, I believe, one outstanding question uh, that they've asked us and uh, pending approval from the zoning board, we will finalize our permit with New Hampshire Department of Environmental Services and move back to the planning board. Um, so so Madam Chairwoman, I would like uh, the request um, that uh, a butters be served with that, uh, the copy of that application and uh, what's, in those, uh, what's in those materials as we've seen what is here. And this may not be the right venue. Maybe I have to go to the Department of Environmental Services to get that document. But I think it will be really helpful uh, for this deliberation. I mean, the point that I'm making here is that this decision is forever for that particular ecosystem and that there's no way to go back. And so, um, you know, some people seem to behave as if I'm an inconvenience here or I'm causing a problem where there isn't a problem. Um, I would say for the ecosystem, 
anytime we disturb it, degrade it, um, we have to because you know, you know, we need to live and people need places to live and houses need to go up. I understand that, but we need to minimize that kind of impact to the very best of our abilities and not quickly ride roughshod over uh, legitimate concerns that I'm bringing forward. Um, so I would also respectfully request that uh, the members of the board treat this a butter and um, citizen of the town with respect uh, rather than sort of uh, the, a, a tone that I heard this evening, which in my mind is, uh, is inappropriate. Um, but uh, to summarize my question, what under your purview are we uh, in this, if you could ask Mr. Berry, uh, would he be, please, could he furnish a copy of his application to the state uh, Department of Environmental Services on this? Mr. Berry. Madam Chair, the application uh, was submitted through the uh, clerk's office with a copy tendered to the Conservation Commission Planning Board and clerk. Uh, Are you talking about the, the land use clerk? Uh, no, the town clerk, okay. uh, which may have been forwarded on to uh, the planning department. So there is a copy of that application on file. Um, Madam Chair, could you ask him who is the point of contact the Department of, Envi of um, Environmental Security? Who's the contact? Environmental um, Services, Mr. Kerwood. I'm sorry. That's okay. Her you have is, to know that, Chris. Yes, her name is Stephanie Gialongo. Would you mind spelling? Uh, I'm not even going to attempt Stephanie's last name. <laughs> okay. Gialongo, huh? Sounds like that begins with a G. Probably. Um, so, uh, so I'm only a member of the public, but my I just want to be sh just be very clear about my requests here. Um, uh, I I I'd like to see a written record of this site walk. Um, the um, and I. I I, I think before this committee acts, it would be prudent for the public to be able to review that written record of the site walk. Um, I would like to see a, an assessment of, I'd like, to, I'd like the, com the committee to answer the question of how do you conduct an assessment of vernal pools? Now this is, you know, you, you can get temporary pools perhaps in the fall, but we're talking about the runoff after the snowpack in the springtime, which is why it's called a vernal pool. Um, I'd like to have an answer from the committee is if you are willing uh, for this or perhaps there'll be future items as well to get expert reviews. I think personally, it's asking a lot for citizen volunteers to understand um, the level of hydrology and ecosystem services uh, that people um, with engineering degrees and PhDs and all that um, are considered expert about. I, I you know, I, I, I love it that people volunteer to do this, but I, I, th I think that it's, uh, it's unfair to the end of the process to have people who are uh, being asked to behave as experts when it's not training. Um, and uh, I would like to be sure that this committee is paying attention to the, the question of the danger to the amphibians, the other animals that are there. By the, uh, the concentration of houses on this particular lot requires this crossing of the, of the wetlands. Fewer units on this lot would not run into these same problems. And, um, you know, in a time when we're, you know, when we mess with the ecosystem, we get things like viruses coming out of forests and into, in this case, in China and Pangolin, and we're in this pandemic because of the destruction of the forest that took place um, where those animals were taken from. This is not just sort of, oh yeah, you know, the greenies wanna do something. No, we, our natural heritage is really, really important here. And the ecosystem services that we get are really important and it's useful to pay attention to the value of those services as well as to the value of making money. Um, 
There's one other comment that I have from last week that I did not, from the last session that I need to offer up now. Uh, part of the application, I think it's section five, talks about hardship if this is denied. The only language that I saw about hardship is, is that they're gonna make less money. And making less money, in other words, sacrificing these animals because of the profit motive, I don't think is an appropriate use of public resources. We, you know, you guys on this committee, you, I'm sorry, you folks in this committee hold the public trust here. And so um, being willing to fast track degradation of important eco services with um, the extenuating circumstance with the, with, the, with the difficulty being that, oh, they're not gonna make enough money. I just, I don't see that as a, as a proper way uh, to decide this. So thank you for listening. You're welcome. And I'm going to, um, I'm going to say that we are not going to, unless, unless members of the board talk me out of it, we're not going to wait until you have had time to examine the minutes of the site walk because you were invited to it. You were, the public was invited to it and you could have come and seen it. I will ask Joanna to send you those minutes if you would like them now even. Oh, please. She's prepared to email them to you, I believe. If you, yeah, if you, if, you, if, uh, if you wouldn't mind emailing it to, if there are any other abutters or citizens who are on this please. circuit who would like to have that, please, uh, if, Madam Chairwoman, if you would pull them and ask them if they would like to see this, this document as well. I would rather not make that available to people on your, on polling them. I don't know who else is here. No one else is asked to speak. If people ask to speak and want it, then we will ask Joanna. But right now I'm just asking her to send it to you as you've requested it, if that's okay with you. But she needs your email address in order to do that or some way to read. I have his email address. Okay, sorry. So can you- Someone, else, someone else is trying to speak, uh, I'm noticing on the board here. Hello? Uh, Dennis Buck, uh, hold on a second. Joanna, are you set with that? I don't want to give her too many things to do at once because she has to take minutes. Are you good with that? Okay. Yes, I am. Dennis Buck, would you care to speak? Um, we would also like to uh, have that emailed to us. And does Joanna have your email address? No. But I can send it to her. Are there are there other are there further questions from the public on this matter? I have a quick question. Identify yourself, please. My name is Danny Arsenal. Address, please, Mr. Arsenal. 104 Kelsey Road in Nottingham. Thank you. And um, if an EIA is done, is that public record? An EIA? The Environmental yeah, Impact Assessment. Can you answer that? I don't really know the answer to that question. I, I would imagine that is again, something the planning board would address. Oh. If a lot is going to have more than four or more divisions, then the, an EIA is required. And I just was curious if that required by whom? Division of Environmental Services. Uh, it's in the guidelines, ten point six of the Zoning Board regulations. Okay, so that would be the Planning Board's province. Okay. I mean, they're in charge of subdivisions and all of the various details of subdivisions. Right. We we only see pieces of them. Okay. So if there is such a document, Joanna, would you know she's also the clerk for the planning board? Do you remember? It might be a question that you would have to address to the board, the planning board. Yeah, that's not one that I've heard talked about, but it doesn't mean it doesn't exist. It's just not one okay. well, Bonnie, it's on it's it's in the town subdivision regulations. So that's a planning board. Yes, it is. And, oh. it, and, it, 
if it is 10.6 of the um, subdivision, which is planning board. Okay, thank you. Anyone else? Uh, Mr. Berry, there, there being no further questions from the public, Mr. Berry, is there anything you would like to say in conclusion? Um, Madam Chair, I think the only uh, piece of Mr. Kerwood's discussion that I'd really like to, uh, I guess, refute is that nowhere in our application package do we discuss money. We do discuss um, the impact of denial of wetlands crossings on reaching developable land. And so there may be a, an indirect correlation to financial gain but the point of the application is that denial of wetland crossing in this particular project's case would be the denial of access to very useful productive uplands. And that's, that's really the, the, uh, the matter at hand. Thank you. Okay, do, do members of the board wish to comment? I'm going to close the public portion of the hearing to allow for deliberation by the members of the board. And you'll have to excuse me for one second. Sorry, I had to put another log on the fire. There, there being no public discussion, um, I, I will entertain a motion on this application. Madam Chair, I move to accept case 201, excuse me, 20-014-VA application from Robert DeBerto requesting a variance from Article 3, Section B4 of the Nottingham Zoning Ordinance as requested. Did you get that, Joanna? Is there a second? I'll second it. A motion has been made and seconded to, to accept the application as presented. Application number 20-014-BA. All those in favor, I'm gonna poll the board separately since we're all mixed up here among the participants and I am the chairman and I will vote in favor of the motion. Terry, could you be, vote next, please? Yeah, I'll vote in favor. Um, Kevin Bassett. In favor. Teresa. In favor. Raylene. We can't hear you, Raylene. Hmm. I recuse myself from the discussion and participation on the vote of this, as I have not been um, Present. available to do the site walk or the other participation required. Thank you. So we have four ayes and one abstention. Is that correct, Joanna? Mr. Berry, your application has been approved. You have a 30 day window in which anyone may file an appeal to this decision. Well, thank you for the board's uh, input and consideration on the application. You're welcome. <clears throat> the next case before the board, case number 20-016-VA, application from Joseph Falzone requesting a variance from Article 3, Section B.4 of the Nottingham Zoning Ordinance to permit wetland crossing on approximately 3,000 square feet to access lots 2, 4, 5, and 6 for a proposed subdivision. The property is located on Guile Road in Nottingham New Hampshire and is identified as tax map 40, lot number one. 
Same. Bonnie, may I, may I bring a point of order to this? Yes. The um, case written is based on the letter, I believe, that the lawyer or somebody had drawn up. But in looking at the maps, lots one, two, and three do not cross the wetlands. It's lots four, five, six, and seven that are, um, well, actually lot, um, I, I sit corrected here, lot three does, but it is in a shared driveway as, as has been pointed out. So lots one and two do not cross, but lot three has a crossing and four, five, six. So you think two is, a, lot two is a typo? Pardon me? You think the two in this is a typo, a typographical error, it should say three, four, five, and six. Three, four, five, six, and seven, because the shared driveways on four and five, six, and seven cross, and three alone. Three, four, five, six, and seven. Is that correct, Mr. Felzone? Or who's yeah, yeah, so, yeah, a total of five. Okay, so uh, is it uh, are, so the so the case application? We're just trying to make sure the language is correct. So are your the crossing is to access lots three, four, five, six, and seven. Is that correct? Um, yes, it, it, it only crosses lot three. It, it, the, the wetland crossing is on lot three and the access for the crossings uh, are sheared from um, three, four, five, six, and seven. Right, no, that's no, no. No, not according to your map. According to your map and according to the letter to the, to the Conservation Commission, your initial cross is, if you need a single driveway that will cross wetlands for lot three. For lot, a shared driveway is for, is for five, four and five and six and seven. Well, if you look at the map, two and three, two right. and three a driveway and the crossing no, I, I don't two. see that Terry I see a separate driveway for one and a separate driveway for two not for two and three if you look very carefully that driveway goes right into lot three it does not go into lot two there There's is a little, no line a little thing that branches off you gotta look you right. can't really, but just it's a small like, little branch that goes off it, it's just it's not just it's not wide up. at all like the other one is I, I disagree yeah it's almost to the map. <clears throat> Good evening, everyone. This is this is Justin Passe, uh, the lawyer on behalf of Joe Falzoning tonight, just to jump in and clear up any confusion. I, I the, the way that I understand the, the plan, subject to Joe or Jim Gove, who's also on the line saying otherwise, is that there is indeed a shared driveway uh, that accesses, I mean, there are three impacts. I mean, let's get that straight first. There are three proposed Correct. impacts, three crossings. And yep. the way that I understand the plan is that those are contemplated by uh, the first one on the driveway that serves both lot two and three, the second one on the driveway that serves both lot four and five, and then the third one, which is exclusively on lot six, but which also ultimately branches off to serve lot seven as well. So I, I think that's the way it's drafted in the application. If it's not, certainly we're happy to, well, to make that slight that modification. Lot three is not mentioned and seven is not mentioned, at least on my um, summary page here. So I think we should add two and seven to those. That sounds reasonable, Madam Chair. Okay, so can you correct my reading of that, Joanna, to, to say to permit a wetland crossing on approximately 3,000 square feet to access lots two and three, four and five, and six and seven. And those are three crossings. Not one, two, three, not six. So the same rules will apply to this hearing as applied to the previous one, which is that the applicant will have an opportunity to um, present his case or to have his agent present his case. Um, Mr. Passe, is that how you say your name? It is, thank you. Okay, um, are you going to um, present for Mr. Falzone? That's correct. Okay, so 
you will have the floor first. You will present your case. Um, it's good for you to put up any visuals, maps, whatever that you wish. And um, then the board members will ask questions if they have them. Um, we have also been on a site walk for this case. Um, and then members of the public will be invited to address your application, either speak in favor or against or, or, or neutral, however they wish to express themselves. And then you will be given the opportunity to rebut anything that anybody says. And then the board will, I will close the hearing and the board will deliberate and hopefully make a decision on your application. So you may now have the floor, sir. Okay, thank you, Madam Chair. Again, my name is Justin Passe. It's very good to be with all of you tonight. Um, I'm a lawyer at DTC in Portsmouth, New Hampshire, here tonight on behalf of Joe Falzoni, who is the applicant, and as you noted, uh, seeking a variance from Article 3, Section B4 of the Zoning Ordinance to permit a wetland impact uh, to accommodate crossings to access five of a, the proposed seven lots of a, uh, at this point, conceptual subdivision. Um, I'm joined tonight remotely by Joe Falzoni, as well as Jim Gove of Gove Environmental, who I'm, I'm sure all of you are, are well acquainted with. Um, and as for our, our presentation proposal tonight, I'll do a quick overview and talk about the property itself, the relief that we're seeking. And then I'm gonna turn it over to Jim Gove, who's gonna discuss the wetlands and the wetland crossings proposed uh, to access these five lots. Uh, and then ultimately I'd like to, uh, to address the individual variance criteria and apply the facts of, of this particular case to the statutory variance criteria. Um, and obviously we're happy to address any questions that the board may have or any questions that the public has as well. But I will attempt to share my screen here uh, just to put the plan up in the background as I speak, if that's permitted. It is, it is recommended even. Okay. So, and I might just shrink this a bit so people can see it better. So the property, which is identified as tax map 40 lot one is large. It's 61 and a half acres in size. And it's located obviously on Guile Road in the Western portion of Nottingham uh, within the town's residential agricultural zoning district. Uh, the minimum lot size here is two acres. The minimum uh, road frontage is 200 feet and the open space requirement is 60%. Um, the property is surrounded primarily by single family residential uses, uh, save for a large tract to the eastern portion, which is the top of this plan, uh, this area up here, which is a tract that's about 101 acres of unimproved uh, property. Uh, Jim will get obviously into more details regarding the nature of the wetlands themselves, but as you can see, and just to orient the board here, this is Guile Road down here. These are the seven lots, one, two, three, four, four, five, six in this large 35 and a half acre parcel to the far right is lot seven. Uh, the, the three proposed uh, wetland crossings here are, uh, as we've now uh, discussed and identified, are located here, here, and here. Um, the important thing to know at the outset is that the wetland areas on this property are close to, to the sort of western, southwestern area of this property along Guile Road and the uplands, the developable area, is located in the back of the proposed lots. Um, I think that the, the development context and history here is important for the board's review and consideration. So by way of just brief background, Mr. Falzoni has been actively pursuing subdivision of this parcel since about January of 2019. At that time, Joe filed a design review uh, request with the planning board for an 18 lot subdivision of the same property uh, in both a cluster and conventional uh, design form. Uh, those designs would have obviously required a, a subdivision road um, and that design review was not particularly well received by the planning board or the public due to among other things perceived traffic impacts. So uh, taking that uh, response, um, to heart, Joe went back to the planning board and developed essentially two different concept plans, which are relevant, I think, for the discussion tonight. Uh, the first plan was a 14 lot subdivision design, uh, which is depicted in what uh, is enclosure one of the packet, but I'll, I'll scroll up just to show you. Again, this is the same orientation of the property. This is a 14 lot subdivision, conventional subdivision design that contemplates obviously uh, a new subdivision road here, a uh, cul-de-sac bulb at the end, and then 14 uh, developable lots. 
Um, this concept does not contemplate and would not require any wetland relief from uh, the ZBA. The second plan that was developed, the second conceptual plan that was developed is this plan, which is the plan that's uh, before the ZBA tonight. And that plan contemplates only seven lots, um, but would not require, as you can see, a, a new subdivision road. As a result of the orientation though, and by virtue of the location of the wetlands on the property, this plan uh, does contemplate uh, about 2,900 square feet of proposed wetland impacts necessitated by the crossings that we've already uh, discussed. Um, the, the first wetland crossing, on, and I'll scroll down to this third plan, the first wetland crossing uh, would create approximately 450 square feet of wetland impact. Uh, the second would create approximately 970 feet of wetland impact. And the third would create approximately 1,570 square feet of wetland impacts. And as this board is aware, those impacts are prohibited under Article 3, uh, Section B4, which is why Mr. Valzoni is here tonight seeking the variance relief. As Jim will discuss in greater detail, to offset these uh, proposed impacts, Mr. Falzoni is proposing uh, using these special eco passages, which are wildlife tunnels that maintain continuity, which of course is one of the preeminent concerns when you're talking about uh, filling wetlands, uh, the impact to the wildlife. So we've provided an uh, enclosure three of our submittal, which goes into greater depth and explains those crossings and what they're aimed to do and how they function. But again, uh, Jim will discuss that further. So with those two concepts in hand, the 14 lot conventional subdivision and then this seven lot uh, conventional subdivision, Mr. Falzoni approached first the Conservation Commission and then the planning board to get a, a sense, a non-binding read essentially on what project those two boards would prefer. Um, first, Mr. Falzoni went to the Conservation Commission on the, the 19th of October. And as reflected in the enclosure in the letter that we provided after discussion uh, and, and public input, the Conservation Commission unanimously endorsed this seven lot uh, plan. Um, and also uh, endorsed the notion of, of, of the use of these eco passages. And further, the Conservation Commission recommended that a, a deed restriction be placed on this large uh, 35 acre parcel uh, to the far right here, um, on essentially the southern portion of the lot um, to prevent further subdivision because by virtue of its size, obviously further subdivision could at least be uh, contemplated. So those were the two uh, recommendations of the Conservation Commission. Uh, their opinion was memorialized in a letter that they sent to the planning board, which is enclosure four of our packet which states that all five members were unanimously in favor of the seven lot proposal because in their words, it preserved more open space and there would be more overall protection for the wetland complex with fewer houses. A few days later, Mr. Falzoni uh, appeared before the planning board in a uh, design preliminary review context um, with the two designs once again, and like the Conservation Commission, after review and discussion, the planning board unanimously voted to support uh, uh, the seven lot design. It, its support was uh, like the Conservation Commission rooted uh, in a lack of substantial impact contemplated by this plan in front of you. Um, less road infrastructure and less potential uh, noise than the 14 lot concept. Um, in fact, I think the planning board really opined that the 14 lot plan would cause problems with enforcement or potential problems with enforcement with wetland impacts by future homeowners and would have uh, in general a higher impact on town services. Um, and, and I also just state that my understanding is without having been at these meetings that uh, the abutters to the project and members of the public generally have expressed a, 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 a preference for this seven lot design. Um, so the plan now in light of that non-binding review uh, from Mr. Falzoni and the input that's been received from the Conservation Commission and the Planning Board is to proceed with this seven lot concept. Um, and as a result, uh, variance relief is required as is uh, state uh, wetlands permit uh, permission as well. But this is really the first step here. Um, the obvious caveat to all of this is that if variance release isn't obtained and just as a matter of, of fact, uh, Mr. Falzoni will proceed with the 14 lot uh, design, which does not require the, the relief. That's just the, the subtext here. And it's just a reality uh, of the circumstances of this case. Um, 
So the, the last thing I'll say before I turn it over to Jim to talk about the wetlands is that Mr. Falzoni, uh, should this board vote to approve the variance application, would specifically and affirmatively request two conditions. Um, and those conditions would be first, that uh, he use the eco passages that we have described in our filings and that Jim will discuss now, um, or an equivalent uh, for the actual crossings in this case. And the second proposed condition is that, uh, again, if approved, lot seven will indeed uh, have a deed restriction in it that would prohibit uh, further subdivision of that lot. And again, those are the two recommendations from the Conservation Commission. So I think that's sort of the, the setup here in the background. I'll turn it over at this point uh, to Mr. Gove, who will talk about the wetlands and the wetland crossings and the infrastructure Mr. Falzoni is proposing to mitigate against the impacts caused uh, by the crossings themselves. Uh, good evening, uh, I'm Jim Gove. I also uh, wanted to note that Scott Cole uh, who was the engineer uh, for this project is also uh, attending this meeting. So if we have some engineering questions, Scott will be available uh, also to answer those. Jim, uh, Scott, Scott isn't attending tonight. He's in Barrington. Uh, I just saw him on here. Oh, okay, good. Yeah. So. Um, Hi, Joe. Uh, so, so Scott is here. Um, uh, anyway, so. From the standpoint of what these wetlands are, these are your typical uh, red maple forested wetlands. Um, they're actually seepage wetlands that uh, start uh, from at the lower point of the topography. Uh, and so we actually, the first crossing that you see there, that's the well, no, mo northernmost crossing or to the left, and the smallest crossing is actually uh, starts as a, a slight little wet meadow area that goes into the forested area. And uh, it's, it's very small, uh, at, as noted, uh, at 450 square feet. Uh, the concept of the eco passage uh, that is being proposed here is that even though these are only driveways, um, the idea is that uh, there still should be some connectivity for the smaller mammals, reptiles, and amphibians that move along a wildlife corridor. And so these eco passages, and the, and the reason they're called eco passages is because not only are they basically wide enough so that the smaller animals don't feel trapped, they're three feet wide, but the other issue is if you, if you think about, you know, if you were going into a dark cave, not knowing what was there, you would, you would say to yourself, oh, I really don't want to go there. And that's the problem that oftentimes happens uh, in places where we're trying to maintain this connectivity of smaller mammals, amphibians, reptiles moving back and forth. The eco passages actually has a grate on top. So the light comes down into it. So instead of going through a cave, they're basically going through a lit area where they feel comfortable in moving back and forth. And this has been proven. This has been proven uh, in uh, Canada. It's been proven in Florida. Uh, it is a, a technology that is being utilized uh, in Massachusetts. And so uh, this is uh, so this concept of an eco passage basically allows us to maintain this connectivity throughout the wetland, and 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 so that essentially we do not lose that connectivity due to crossings. So as we move uh, further south, uh, there's the there's the one uh, in the middle, uh, so to speak. And that, uh, again, has an eco passage. And then the largest one, the largest crossing, which is further to the south, also has an eco passage. And what this does is it allows that connectivity to be maintained throughout and that the uh, amphibians, reptiles can go back and forth. Now, obviously, we know that sometimes amphibians and reptiles and small mammals sort of will go onto a road because otherwise it, uh, you wouldn't, you, know, you see roadkill, right? Because that's what happens. But 
in this case, uh, it's actually been shown because they move along the wetland boundary that they actually prefer going through the eco passage as opposed to crawling up the side of the, the, the fill of the, of the driveway, crossing there and then going back down. It's just a matter of, of ease of movement. So altogether, this concept of having these eco passages basically makes this a much more environmentally friendly area and, and essentially means that we aren't impacting the wetland at all as far as its functions and values. Also, it's they're really large, okay? And, and uh, over, over and above what would be normally required, because remember, this is a fairly small watershed we have here. And so, and so in terms of passing even the 100 year flood event, uh, these eco passages are oversized. Uh, so essentially, again, hydrologically, uh, we're not uh, impacting the wetlands uh, in any way. So uh, I'd be glad to answer any questions. Or maybe Scott can, uh, uh, maybe I've missed something from Scott, but I'll, or either that or I'll just turn it back over to Justin. Scott, do you have anything to add? No, I think actually both of you covered it very well. Uh, if, there's any, if there's any concerns or questions, I'll be happy to, to answer it, but you did a good job. Madam Chair, we're happy to go right to the variance criteria, but uh, certainly at this point, I, you know, we, we're happy also to take a pause and answer any technical questions or engineering or, or wetland related questions. I was going to suggest that um, the board members ask questions at this point. Sounds good. Does anyone Madam have Chair, a question? Kevin here, I have a question. Chair? Madam Chair? Uh, I didn't, who's speaking, Kevin? This is Raylene. Raylene, hi Raylene. Um, I just uh, wanted to ask, um, in the early part of the presentation, there was a statement of using the echo passes or a reasonable substitute. Was I'm not sure that was quite the language, but um, if someone could just, um, I assume, I'm not sure, so I won't say I assume. If there is an alternate model used, will that require any review to ensure that it meets the, the same benefits and um, to the ecosystem as the original passage that was presented at the Nottingham Conservation Commission? Uh, certainly, thanks for the question. It was, it's my language, I attempt, I, I figure right. I should attempt to explain it. Um, so, to the extent, and this is a Jim question or a Joe Falzoni question, to the extent that Eco Passages is a trade name or a product, right. I think there's no problem with saying that, that that any condition of approval will be that. You know, my 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 concern is just availability of that precise product that's called that precise thing. I think the goal is to utilize something that accomplishes precisely what is depicted in Enclosure Four, I believe it is, which discusses what's happening. Uh, as, as Jim has explained, essentially the daylighting of a tunnel to, uh, to provide continuity for wildlife. Okay, that was my question, not yeah. so much the, the product itself, right. but that right. whatever substitutes for that specific project that has the same benefits right. for the wildlife. Um, yeah, yeah. That, if, that if is I, a goal. Yeah, if I may, if I may explain too, um, Justin is correct. The eco passage is actually, uh, I'm not sure it's a trademark because it's been utilized in so many places, but there is uh, what is actually called an eco passage, which is manufactured both in Canada uh, and I believe it's now also manufactured down south. But it turns out that it's just the concept of having a, a box culvert with an open grate on it. So like, for instance, one of the, fir the first one is actually going to be put in is, is being put in in Portsmouth, New Hampshire. And in that case, they didn't follow the set design of what the <coughs> eco passage was there. They actually made it a little bit wider. They made them five feet wide. And so technically, they meet the criteria of an eco passage very well because it has the open grate. But I guess you really couldn't call it an eco passage because it's a slightly different design. So I think that's what Justin was getting to. Right. Well, I, I want to thank you for um, taking the 
and Mr. Falzone for taking that environmental piece under consideration and looking for alternatives to ensure that there is benefit and that there is passage. Can I, can I just interject here that I took it upon myself to Google the term eco passage and I'm coming up with the fact that it, it's a concept more than a trademark or more than a brand. Eco passage refers to specially designed fencing and culverts that aim to reduce roadkill by providing small animals with a safe way to cross the road. It doesn't say anything about daylighting it though. So that I think is an Funny. important part of the concept in this particular case. So I suppose that we could just qualify and, and just memorialize for all of eternity here on this on this hearing tonight that the purpose is to provide, mm -hmm. as Jim said, a box culvert type design with a grading feature that daylights the 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 tunnel, uh, so to speak, uh, that connects the two wetland areas for continuity. Right. I think that's probably be important when we get to the motion. Okay. If we get to a positive motion anyway. Madam Chair, I have a question. Yeah, I have, I have Sorry, no questions. Um, is this a, a dry passage 12 months out of the year, or is there intended <clears throat> water flow in the passage? The, uh, the actual location of the passage is in the lowest point uh, of where uh, the wetland at that point is. And at that point, we do have flow going through there. In fact, at the site walk, we saw exactly that, that in the, in the low point of that, uh, where the eco passage is gonna be, it's gonna function both as a culvert, a cross culvert, as well as a uh, mechanism of uh, allowing the uh, amphibians to go back and forth. And, and so, while the water levels are relatively shallow, um, it, is, it is functioning as, as both a culvert and as an eco passage. Is there such a passage that does both supply a, a dry path and a wet path at the same time? Um, there um, in Portsmouth, uh, they did several. Uh, eco passages. Uh, it was uh, a little different situation uh, in that these are very narrow uh, driveways. Uh, and uh, so, uh, you know, appropriate one eco passage. The, and, and the crossing is very uh, narrow too here. Uh, in Portsmouth, the reason they put in multiple ones <clears throat> is because the actual crossing was over a hundred feet wide. Uh, and so they, the concept there was they uh, would supply the eco passages in several locations, one of which was in actually the center of a stream and then two others were outside. So they tried to accomplish both. Very, very good. Yes. Um, your um, expectation of a normal year um, snow melt, um, as I didn't go to the site walk, um, on the three crossings, just in general, um, water will be prevalent. Three months, out snow year, melt. six months out of the year, <coughs> nine months. Big about when? The, 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 the areas we're talking about here are seasonally saturated. So that means essentially during snow melt, you'll have some water there. Uh, we certainly saw it uh, uh, at the site walk because we'd had some snow and then we'd had some melt. Uh, and so we had water there. Um, probably I, I, my estimation, nine months out of the year, you're not gonna have water there at all. Okay, understood, thank you. Pictorially, it looks like the, <clears throat> um, the widths of these ecosystems are 
from smaller to the left and larger on the right? Is that how I interpret it? The, the actual width of the echo passages, and maybe Justin, can you, I don't know if you can scroll <coughs> in closer to look at those. Uh, they're, assen they're essentially the same, uh, they don't really have the detail. There is a detail sheet, which maybe Scott has. They're the same for all three crossings. They're the same for all three crossings, basically. The, uh, the only, the only uh, caveat is of where they're located. Like for instance, the, uh, the first one to the left is located right square in the middle because that is in fact the low point of that swale. The, uh, the one that is um, uh, the middle one is located more to the north or upper part because that is the lower point. And then again, the next one uh, is um, uh, located more in the middle because that is in fact where the lower point is uh, for that particular wetland. It, we want to have these in the lower point, uh, mainly because we do not want to cause any upstream ponding. That would be, that would be detrimental both to the wetland itself because it would change the hydrology as well as be detrimental to the uh, driveway uh, surface. And you led me right to my next question. Being a grate, you'll have surface debris, leaves, what have you, um, you know, filling the area at, at times. Um, how does it flush itself out or does that have to be done by human, um, you know, periodically to, right. to keep it open? You know, typically what has been found in other locations is that they are self-flushing. However, if in fact we have the situation, and certainly remember this is a forested community. So if in fact we have the situation where a tree falls just upslope of it <clears throat> and blocks that opening, that opening needs to be uh, opened back up by uh, the owner. Uh, otherwise it will act as a dam. As, would, as it would if there was any kind of culvert there. Uh, Joanne, is there any means of enforcing such a uh, requirement? That would be in the easements and uh, deeds. And with these being shared driveways, how do you figure who's responsible for it. Unless there's some provision, I'm not sure of the deed or whatever it, way, I'm just, uh, I'm just poking. Yeah, there'll be an easement uh, agreement. This is Joe Falzoni that spells out their responsibility. And uh, those grates in the event, Kevin, you were asking if debris got clogged into them. The manufacturer, you can lift those grates out. They're only two feet, approximately two feet deep. And you could, if something got in there that was causing a backup, it's very accessible to, to enter it and clean it. Do you have further questions, Kevin? Um, I can I can relinquish the floor for a minute. D does anyone else have questions of the applicant? Yeah, I, I have one question. <clears throat> okay, Terry. Yeah, this is uh, Terry Barnes. I just had uh, the driveway is going to be all hot topped. Some will, some won't. Well, because. I see a problem with like plowing through there. If you if you got dirt, I mean, it might work yeah, good in park. I, I mean, they'll they'll be paved to the crossing to get to the other side. Uh, I can't tell you right now because I don't know exactly where the house is located within the building envelope. But they'll be they'll be paved to the crossing uh, to the other side on the upland portion. I couldn't tell you until I knew where the house was going to be. 
Right. Good. I, I mean, I see a problem, you know, if they're not paved, you're going to be going through there with no frost and pushing yeah. dirt. From, uh, you'll even tear the, the grapes up. So. Oh, right. But but on the other side, they'll be outside of the wetlands. They'll be into the uplands. Okay. Thank you. Anyone else? Teresa, Raylene, do you have questions, comments? Or Kevin? So we seem to be um, out of questions here. And I'm going to ask you to uh, proceed with your presentation, Mr. Passe. Okay, thank you, Madam Chair. I would say just sort of to close the loop on that last issue that was brought up, certainly the, the uh, when and if a formal subdivision application is filed with the planning board, they will be interested in ensuring the appropriate and reciprocal driveway maintenance agreements because each of these uh, crossings relate to a shared driveway. So uh, I'm, 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 uh, I feel strongly that, that there will be provisions within those uh, individual shared driveway maintenance agreements that in, include uh, the provision to uh, maintain these eco passages. So that's another safeguard I think that will be taken up at the planning board level. So I just wanted to, to, to say that. Um, and, and with that, I'll, I'll transition into the review of the variance criteria, which is a, a bit arduous, but I think it's important to just get it right and, and establish for the record why this proposal and why this variance uh, request meets the statutory criteria. So uh, turning first to the uh, public interest and spirit of the ordinance criteria, as the board is aware, the New Hampshire Supreme Court has indicated that those first two criteria uh, are coextensive and should be addressed together. So that's what we'll do. We'll take up both of those at the same time. And under those first two variance criteria, a variance is only contrary to the public interest and spirit of the ordinance if it unduly and in a marked degree conflicts with the ordinance in a way that violates the ordinance's basic zoning objections. A uh, simple conflict with the regulation is not sufficient. Um, and the Supreme Court has given us two main tests to review these individual criteria. And the question, the relevant question really is whether the proposed variance will alter the essential character of the neighborhood and whether it will threaten the public health, safety, or welfare. If the answer to both of those questions uh, is that there will be no uh, uh, impact to the character of the neighborhood and no threat to the public health or safety, then the first two variance criteria are, are satisfied under our law. Um, and the Supreme Court has also said that where possible, the ZBA should consider the actual language of the zoning ordinance. So here, uh, the general purposes of the zoning ordinance outlined in Article 1 are to obviously uh, protect public health, um, preserve rural character of the town, ensure that the land use is consistent with the land's capability and not detrimental to the environment, and to preserve the town's uh, aesthetic appeal. Uh, there's no express statement of purpose, of purpose in Article 3, the relevant article here regarding the, the town's wetland conservation areas. Um, but suffice to say, the purpose of all of these uh, regulations for pertaining to, to wetland impacts is to protect the environment. Um, and, and in this case, the proposed impacts um, are only related to crossings, which provide reasonable access to the property uplands. And uh, the crossings are designed, as Jim uh, referenced here, to mitigate impact by uh, using these eco passages, which will preserve the wetland function and continuity uh, for the wildlife at play. As a result, I think the variance that's being proposed in the, you know, the, the corresponding seven lot uh, subdivision concept is actually more harmonious with the zoning ordinance than the 14 lot uh, uh, subdivision concept because it satisfies the general purposes of the zoning ordinance that I just referenced and the implied purpose of uh, the, the conservation uh, article. Uh, specifically, it protects the public health and safety by providing reasonable access to upland while avoiding a new subdivision road, which would obviously have significantly more impervious surface and would uh, lead to higher density in a 14 lot concept. It preserves Guile Road in the rural character of the town with a concept that has less density. It voluntarily restricts development or further development, I should say, on the area identified as lot seven on this plan in front of you. And it, it acknowledges the, the sensitivity of the environment and the surrounding wetlands by using these uh, sort of cutting edge eco passages. So 
the proposed variance is not contrary to the public interest um, and it doesn't violate the spirit of the ordinance because strictly enforcing the provision of the zoning ordinance at issue here uh, would not advance the general and implied purposes of the zoning ordinances. Uh, beyond that, uh, certainly there's, there's, uh, uh, there, there will be no impact to the essential character of the neighborhood because it's, this variance is leading to a seven lot uh, design. The lots, as we've explained in our, in our filings, are large, significantly larger than most of the single family residential uses in the area. And certainly the, the variance will protect, uh, excuse me, will not threaten the public health or safety and welfare. Uh, because again, we're providing access only to five lots. We're doing so in an environmentally friendly manner. And, and this variance is helping to secure a seven lot concept versus a 14 lot concept. So to summarize those first two criteria, I think they're satisfied because the proposed variance furthers the general and the implied purposes of the, of the ordinance in this question. And it, it will not compromise the essential character of the neighborhood or threaten the public health or safety. Um, so turning to the third prong of the statutory variance criteria, the question really is whether or not substantial justice is done. And you know what does substantial justice mean? Well, the guiding rule in this context is that any loss to the individual that is not outweighed by a gain to the general public is, is an injustice. So to put it another way, there's got to be some gain to the general public from denying a variance that outweighs the loss to the applicant from its denial. Here, uh, we would submit that the public stands to gain nothing from denying the variance requested because uh, as evidenced by the, the, uh, the support from the planning board, the support from the Conservation Commission, and really the, the preference expressed by abutters in the public for the seven lot uh, design, um, this is not going to be contrary to the public uh, uh, interest. Um, further, the public is protected, obviously, as we've discussed by the environmentally sensitive approach that's being taken to the individual crossings. On the other side of the equation, the variance obviously will be a great benefit to Mr. Falzoni, the applicant, because it's gonna permit a reasonable use of his land. It's going to protect the environment to the greatest extent possible here. And uh, it will lead to uh, uh, this seven lot design versus the 14 lot design. So on this third prong of the statutory variance criteria, I would just say that there is no gain to the general public from denying the variance that outweighs the loss uh, Mr. Falzoni and really the public too would uh, suffer if, if the variance was denied. The fourth of the five statutory criteria requires a finding that the variance will not diminish the surrounding property values. And here, uh, as we've stated, none of the, the surrounding property values will suffer a diminution in value. The wetland impacts themselves will have no impact on the surrounding properties at all. And uh, the upland areas of the property, as you've seen on this plan, which I should probably scale back on here. The upland areas of these uh, proposed lots are located to the, the, uh, the eastern side of the property and are essentially insulated. The building envelopes are insulated from, uh, from substantial view from, from Guile Road. Uh, further, as we've sort of discussed at length here, this single family residential use in these seven lots are going to be consistent with what already exists on, on Guile Road uh, and, and may be in the eyes of the public a better alternative than the 14 lot design. And certainly we're not aware of any uh, evidence that would suggest that uh, seven new lots would impact uh, the surrounding property value. So we would suggest in this context that uh, the fourth prong of the variance criteria is also satisfied. Um, so finally, turning to the last uh, and probably most substantial criteria that of the hardship, as, as the board is well aware, to satisfy this criteria, an applicant has to prove that due and owing to special circumstances and conditions on that property that distinguish it from other properties in the area, no fair and substantial relationship exists between the general public purposes of the ordinance in question and the specific application of that ordinance to the property. And then as a, as a last criteria, the proposed use has to be uh, reasonable. So, you know, just put another way, as I've always viewed this specific criteria, I think this requirement is asking on a fundamental level whether or not it makes sense to apply this specific zoning ordinance to this specific property. And here, I think the answer is no, it doesn't make sense. 
the special conditions of this property, which make it unique from the others around it, is its large size. It's 61 and a half acres of undeveloped property surrounded by primarily a single family residential use that's already developed. Also, the location of the uplands on this property are pushed to the east, adjacent to that unimproved uh, tract uh, further to the east, that's 101 acres. Um, the wetlands located close to Guile Road are, are part of the property's unique circumstances. So in light of those special conditions and in light of the general and implied purposes of the zoning ordinances, which we've discussed, which are again, to preserve the rural character of the town, to ensure inconsistent land uses, to avoid detrimental development and to protect environmentally sensitive wetland and wildlife areas, it doesn't make sense to strictly enforce this specific zoning ordinance um, and deny the variance because doing so won't advance the public purposes of those of the ordinance itself. In fact, you know, denying this variance is going to in all likelihood lead to a 14 lot subdivision, which can be developed by right on this property, which will include a subdivision road, which will add significant impervious surface area, which will add twice as many uh, residential homes and will create more demand on the town's services, et cetera. Uh, beyond all of this, Mr. Falzoni's proposed use of the eco passages will mitigate, uh, as Mr. Gove explained, the, the primary impact of these driveways, which are uh, a, a, uh, an impact to the continuity of the, of the wetland for wildlife. Um, so these eco passages will mitigate, mitigate against that primary impact. Uh, lastly, I would just suggest that this is a reasonable use. This is a proposed single family residential use, which is, as I've stated, uh, consistent with the area uh, and, and will be something that uh, goes a, a long ways to preserving the character of what exists uh, on Guile Road now, especially when you consider Mr. Falzoni's um, proposed condition to limit further subdivision of lot seven. So certainly we'd be happy to answer any question uh, about the, the application of the zoning criteria themselves. But at, at this point, I would turn it back over to the board and once again, um, uh, remind the board of, of our the request for the two distinct um, conditions of approval. And if we get there, I suppose we can re-engage on the appropriate uh, language for those conditions. And thank you very much for your time. Thank you. <clears throat> Do members of the board have questions or comments? I have a comment, Madam Chairman. Chairwoman. Oh, Teresa. I just want to know that if anybody else has felt a repeat threat on this whole case of if you don't give us the seven, you're going to get 14. Um, not for nothing, but I was part of the planning board when the 14 was shown. And I'm glad you brought it down to seven, but I felt that there was a continued and repeated by your own statements, if you're not going to give us this, we're going to develop 14, which I think was totally unnecessary because what you've shown us um, to me is, is more, is appealing. And um, I just think it was unnecessary for you to constantly say that. Does anybody else agree with me? I guess not, but that's okay. I feel the way I feel. Uh, Teresa, I I, yeah. Raylene. It, it was not necessary. We are only reviewing this plot as my understanding. Well, if I may, Madam Chair, um, certainly there's absolutely no intended uh, threat. That is not at all the context of, of our statements or our analysis or the, the documentation that we've provided to the board. Rather, we are very familiar with and want to ensure that we're providing the best information possible to satisfy the statutory zoning, uh, the statutory zoning uh, variance criteria. And that is why Mr. Falzoni has gone uh, through the process he has to get a sense for the, the, the preferences of the town, to get a sense for the preferences of the individual land use boards. Because as you know, part of this variance analysis requires interpreting what the public interest is and interpreting what the spirit of the ordinance is and making an argument about substantial justice. And so there's not a way to do that here uh, without comparing the two concepts that are at play. It is by no means designed 
to be a threat. It's it's it is a it is an effort to explain why the statutory variance criteria are being met in this specific case. That's all. But to use your own words on page two of I don't know who actually wrote this um, application for the applicant. You says you say, and I quote, the caveat is that should this request requested variance be denied, the applicant will pursue the 14 lot plan. That to me sounds like a threat, but like, I mean, it's not like a threat of harm or anything like that. I'm not looking at it that way. But it's like, hey, you give us the seven or we're going for 14, period, end of story. And I don't think that was necessary in repeatedly through your application or your presentation. It should have been on the application for the seven, which is what you're presenting to us, and, and not this completed uh, constant, excuse me, um, reference back to the 14. I'm, I'm just saying, it's that's how it struck me. And um, that I'm just... Just letting you know. I, I look. I appreciate your comment. I, 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 I would characterize it as a as a failed attempt at transparency. That's all. That's all. That's how it was intended. So I appreciate your comment. Thank you. Does anyone else have any questions, comments? Any members of the board? Raylene, did you try to say something before? No. The the issue has been addressed. Okay. So everyone is satisfied. I'm. I'm now going to open up comment and questions to the general public. Are there any members of the public present who wish to address this application? Or speak in favor, speak against, speak in a neutral way, just ask questions. Does anyone wish to, does anyone wish to address the application? Doesn't seem like there's, I, I can't see the hand raised. Joanna, are you watching that? There it is. Nobody seems to have their hand raised. There is a hand raised. There is a hand raised. Um, Carrie Pasco wants to speak. Who wants to speak? Lil Carrie. I don't see it on my list. I think I'm mine's here. not. Okay, there it is. Yeah. Hi. Um, thank you for having this meeting. This has been really very informational. Um, I I, for a second, please. I'm sorry. Could you just state your name and address, please? For yeah, this is yeah. Carrie Pasco, Thank and you. I'm at I'm at one two five Guile Road. Thank you. Uh huh. Go ahead. Um, I want to um, say that the site walk was very informational. It was very helpful, so I really appreciated being able to join in on that. Um, I. I think that Mr. Falzone has done a lot to, to, to take a look at the culture of the road and he's, he's done a, what I think is a pretty good job of meeting the expectations of um, following along with the master plan for, for what Nottingham is and especially what Guile Road is. So I just really wanna say thank you for that. Um, I had a question about the eco passages in terms of their not understanding all the um, engineering going into it, these are very heavy construction um, tunnels, correct? And my question or wondering is, how do we keep or make sure that these do not sink in these soils that they're going to be placed in? Are we going to be putting some sort of grading underneath them? How, how do we keep those eco passages from sinking in the soil once they're put in place when we have a couple winters going through and things start to settle. I mean, I just a, a wonder question there. The uh, uh, typically uh, what happens is uh, they have to be set as a footing, just as you would set any other footing, like for a uh, foundation. So in other words, they, they actually, it has to be actually dug down uh, to a point where a footing can actually be set and then the, and then the uh, sidewalls are put on. So that's, that's a how typically an eco passage is built uh, so that you have, you'll have a, a fairly substantial footing. So once, it, once it's there, it's, it's kind of like a foundation. 
it, it's not going to move because okay. it's going to be down below the frost level. Oh, it is. Yeah. Okay. Oh, okay. All right. I think that answers my question. I just want to say thank you very much. This has been very informative and I really appreciate everything that's been done to accommodate the culture of this road. Thank you. Is there anyone else who wishes to speak this evening? I don't see any hands raised at the moment. I think I can see everybody now. So if not, um, does the applicant wish to make any kind of summary? I think you addressed um, the questions that came up. Do any other members of the board wish to ask questions? If not, and are, are you all set? Mr. Passe, because barring anything from Scott or Jim or or or, uh, or or Joe, I'm I'm all set, and I thank you very much for the time. Okay, so there being nobody nobody else who signaled they want to speak, I'm going to close the public hearing portion and ask the board members to deliberate on this presentation. Does anyone have any comments? I have a question. Um, Joanna, you were trying or, or suggested you might be able to take some pictures during the site walk. Was that, um, did that happen? I can hear you, Joanna, if you're speaking. I can't even see Joanna anymore. There she is. Can't hear me? Can hear you now, yep. Okay, must have been a bad connection there. I took a couple pictures, however, it was snowing, so it didn't come out very clear at all. So they're not worth reviewing, Joanna? Correct, yeah, they okay. came out very blurry. Does he, maybe this is too late for this question, but does the applicant have any pictures available of those to the crossings? We, we submitted uh, pictures of the actual crossings that we're installing uh, ourselves, but the understanding was that the board wanted to visit and see the actual areas and have me uh, have the survey of stake them out, which I did. Understood. Are there any further questions, comments? Uh, Madam Chair, um, at this time, I will be abstaining from this vote. And I think this is the time to let the applicant and yourself know. Um, I was not able to attend yesterday. Um, I made myself available Friday, but that's beside the point. Um, and um, I just don't have the, um, the visualization of what is there now um, to be able to vote uh, yay and nay. Thank you. So now it is time for me to tell the applicant. Um, we do have a full board. Is it, you're not, you're not, you're not um, recusing yourself, so never mind. That that's really that's really only when I would need to advise the applicant that we don't have a full board. And abstention is a is being pleasant. Is that correct, Joanna? Can you hear me, Joanna? Yeah. So anyway, um, I think at this time, if there are no further questions or comments, um, I will entertain a motion from someone from the board. Madam Chair, I move that we accept the application for case 20-016-VA, application from Joseph Falzone, as requested. Um, could you add in the two conditions that, that they use the eco crossings and um, have a deed restriction on lot seven to prevent 
further subdivision. Could you add those to your motion, Teresa? Yes, Madam Chair. With the following stipulations, that the eco crossings be utilized at the sections stated for lots two, three, four, five, six, and seven, as stated during the presentation, and that a deed restriction be placed on lot seven, preventing further development. Thank you. Is there a second? I'll second. So a motion has been made and seconded, and we're going to again vote um, like a roll call. Um, I will vote in favor of the motion and of the application. Kevin, you can you can Kevin. abstain, but you have to do it yourself. Kevin here, I abstain. Thank you. Um, Terry Bonser. Yeah, I vote in favor. Teresa. Yay. Raylene. Aye. You vote in favor. So four yeses and one abstention. Mr. Falzoni, and I apologize, you are known around town as Falzone. I learned the correct pronunciation of your name tonight. I apologize. I'll try to remember in the future. Your application has been approved. Um, today, and I'm, I'm required to warn you that anyone may um, appeal this decision within the next 30 days. So act accordingly. If you risk money in your development, it's on you. I, I just have one question. D uh, in your prior hearing, you voted to accept and then you voted to uh, approve. In this one, you did it all in one procedure. As long as Justin, that's fine. Justin, are you fine? I'm okay. Actually, my recollection is that it was the same process employed in both both hearings. But yeah, okay, that's fine. I just was uncertain. We um we voted, and it's my understanding we voted to accept your application as presented, and which is an approval of your request. Okay. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. You're very welcome. Thank you. Madam Chair, it is done differently with the planning board. They approve, accept the application and then they um, approve or vote in favor of passing. That's what he's looking at. And, and that was so my remembering speaking. Oh, I see. Okay. So we have, we are done with your case, actually. You have been approved. Thank you. You're Thank welcome. You. And I, I see um, two. Two other things on our agenda tonight, Joanna. Staff board members update. Do we have any updates that you need to present to us this evening? No, oh, that's just the placeholder in case anybody has anything they need to discuss. Okay. Um, actually, no, um, it was brought to my attention that the, um, 2021 meetings uh, agenda or schedule. Mm -hmm. All right, give me a moment to, um, to pull that up, okay? Mm -hmm. And I'll share it. Um, there's a couple dates that I need to share with you guys. Um, here it is. It was June and December, Joanna. Okay. Madam Chair, I'll be, I'll be right back. Okay. Until you return on anything. The dates in question are June 15th and June 22nd. She has June 22nd, whereas June 15th is the third Tuesday. Great. So is that posted on the town website? It was no. supposed to be, but it isn't yet that I can find. So, which is a, a good thing because it's in, incorrect. <laughs> yes. And so applica applicants also need to know when the deadlines are. So right, you put that online. I'm only asking because I don't have my 2021 book yet. You know, gotcha. I, I don't use this. Um, yeah. I, 
we've we've had a lot of delays in the office due to um, a lot of different reasons. So for some reason, this hasn't been posted. It's not something I can post, but I have sent, had sent it to the clerk to post it, and it hasn't been done yet. So, so that's a good thing because we can fix it and send to the right one. <laughs> and the December one is also incorrect. That's a question. Yeah, no, so I, I, put, I put the either or date on there and um, oh, I see. that when I sent it to her. So Kevin, are you back? Why are you leaving it either or? 21st is perilously close to Christmas. Exactly right. why. Is it the third uh, Thursday, Wednesday though? What, Tuesday, I mean? It yeah. is the third Tuesday. The 21st or the, wow. Yes, 21st. Members must start on a Tuesday eh? or close to one. <clears throat> it does. It's well, it starts on a Wednesday. December 1st is on a Wednesday. So do you think we should like decide which date to pick when we get closer to it? Well, we may not have a case at all, but I think we should because of people needing to plan for getting their cases in, I think we should save the 14th and I think we not should I think we should change it to the 14th. Let's like hope that the the pandemic is over and people can actually go away for Christmas. A lot of people travel to be with family. And um, the 21st is really close to yes. Christmas itself. I mean, I don't know how the rest of the board feels, but that would be my suggestion. I agree. This is really- I agree. I agree. Yeah, I agree. Okay, so okay. let's change that to the 14th. All right, and then um, the June one is in incorrect. It should be the um, June fifteenth. Okay. So I will fix those and um, adjust the application deadlines as needed. Um, so that's it for that. And then uh, the you other thing was uh, meeting minutes. If you guys could vote on those, that's it for me. Joanna, is it just the 17th that needs to be voted on? 1117? Uh, 1117 what? Sorry. 1117 for minutes and the site walk? Um, October 20th and November 25th are what I have on, on the agenda for tonight. I, um, November 25th would have been the site walk. The seventh, we also, we, I don't think we approved of the 17th minutes though either. Okay, let me check. Sorry if I missed that on your guys' schedule. Okay. She's saying, um, she's saying we need to approve minutes from October, not November. I think we need to approve both October and November. Is that correct? Yeah. yeah. So, sorry, I missed that on my notes. Um, October 20th, November 17th, and November 25th are all minutes that I've sent to you all. Okay. Madam Chair, I've reviewed the minutes for each of these as she sent them out in drafts, and I have sent to her any edits that I had. So, I move that we approve the minutes for October 20th, November 17th, November 25th as edited. Is there a second? I'll second it. Can I ask a question before I take the vote? Joanna, did you send the edited versions out to the board? Yes, I did. Okay, thank you. You're right. welcome. All those in favor of approving Kevin? I'm just making sure I don't think I was involved in the October meeting. So just specifically, You'd I, like to I can approve to the latter two, I believe. You're actually not approving the what was done at a meeting, but you're approving the fact that there's been a documentation done. I went through the same thing with the planning board when I abstained from something. And that's what they're saying is that you're not approving what was said, but the fact that a meeting was held and things these particular things were discussed because they were on the agenda. Just so you're aware. That doesn't sound right. Only because I didn't attend October. Just letting you know what they said. And through Understood. the and that was said through the NHMA as well. Understood. Okay. 
So, so oh, go ahead. You can always abstain, I suppose, Kevin. If you weren't present at one of them. Um, it, since they were all grouped, then I abstain. That's the first vote. <laughs> Teresa. I can make them each individual. I don't really care. I'm just trying to make it so the minutes are approved and we can all say Merry Christmas, Happy New Year, Happy Hanukkah, Happy whatever. Continue on. Raylene. Um, I would have to abstain from November 17th and the walk. Teresa. I, I vote yes on October. I don't think, are we splitting it up in that way? It's one motion. You either abstain from the motion or you vote. I'll abstain from the motion. Okay, thank you. Teresa, are you voting aye? Since she's you made gone. Pardon? She's gone. We assume she said yes. She made the motion, so I assume. And Terry, what's your vote? Yes. And I'll vote yes. So we have a quorum here. Assuming you got her vote, because I did ask her before, Raylene, did you get it, Joanna? Yes. Okay, thank you. <coughs> My dogs have had it. <coughs> shh, shh, shh. <coughs> be quiet, be quiet. You're not waking up. <coughs> so, does that conclude our business this evening, Joanna? Yes, it does. All right, so Merry Christmas and Happy New Year, everybody. And same to you and same to all the others. You need a motion to adjourn. Are, are you having a nor'easter tonight? No, it's supposed to do on Thursday, I hear. Oh. It don't always come on schedule. Uh, we do need a motion to adjourn. I make a motion we adjourn. I need a second. Second. A motion has been made and seconded to adjourn. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed? Kevin, was that an aye? Yes. An aye. Four yeses, Joanna. Okay. Bye, everybody. Very good. Merry Bye. Christmas. Merry Christmas. Merry, Merry Cactus Christmas, Raylene. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Good night, everyone. <laughs> She's in Arizona. All right. Good night. Good night, everybody. Good night. Thank you, Joanna. You're welcome. Take care. Bye-bye.